Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now we will move to the uh, keynote lecture number two, uh, which uh, will be presented by Thomas Driesner. Oops, can you go to this slide? Here? Yeah, by Thomas Driesner. Thomas is an adjunct professor at the Department of Earth Science in ETH Zurich, and he works in the group on mineral resource systems and oil fluids. Uh, Thomas started with a classical geologist background and specialized in hydrothermal fluid thermodynamics and molecular simulation during his PhD, which he obtained at ETH Zurich in 1996, followed by postdocs at ETH, then University of Tennessee and Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and then he came back to ETH in 1999. Uh, Thomas is a renowned expert on fluid thermodynamics, as well as the simulation of natural fluid flow under extreme temperature pressure conditions. This led to original and exciting research in the fields of mid-ocean rich hydrothermal systems, all forming magmatic hydrothermal systems, supercritical geothermal resources. Uh, super hot geothermal resources offer a promising route to higher power output, and therefore understanding and predicting such systems, which are very, very complicated on a physical uh, uh, background is a crucial issue. And his uh, talk today uh, is about numerical simulation aiding the development of super hot geothermal resources. Thomas, I'm pleased to give you the... Uh... Let's see. Okay. Let's see if share screen works. We don't so see the share screen doesn't yet. work. No, not yet. Uh, at least on my side. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Um, try now. Okay. Let's okay. See. Ah, here we go. Oops, I, that's on. So, uh, yeah. Thanks for the nice introduction, Michelle. Um, I hope you can all hear me well. That's so fine. This, I believe this is fine. Okay, perfect. So this presentation is less on numerical methods and things like that, but we will use numerical, or I will try to give you a little tour of how we use numerical simulation to understand how natural high enthalpy geothermal systems operate and uh, how we can actually utilize what has been discovered below these in recent years, the so-called super hot geothermal resources. So I have just over 20 slides and I will try to put a focus on that. I really introduce you into how these systems operate, what physics is relevant if you want to study them. And this gives a back, bit of background in the geology of them, what's their anatomy. There's a bit of thermodynamics about these ill-defined terms, supercritical, superheated, super hot. And then as the example of Iceland deep drilling project, I will try to give you a few insights that we obtained there. And that sort of, in my opinion, have changed the view of how to look at these. So let's start with a very, very simple introduction to these. What you see here is an image of the Krapler geothermal field in Iceland, in Northern Iceland, uh, has been operating since the 1970s, I believe. And this is a typical view. Uh, you see some installations, hot steam condensing in the air, and it's sitting on what used to be a natural geothermal field with geysers, et cetera, et cetera. Now, when you look below that, what is the conceptual view of this is approximately this. So we are um, um, sitting this, um, installations are sitting on the surface and somewhere a few kilometers below there is a body of magma that intruded there and so as geologists we call this an intrusion. This obviously is very hot and it will heat whatever kind of groundwater sits in the pores and in the fractures of the earth crust there and by doing so it will induce thermally driven convection. Down here, surrounding the magma, the fluid can pass and pick up heat. And in these systems, it can pick up so much heat that it actually will start to boil in the subsurface already. 
What is being produced here for power generation is typically for the, from the uppermost two kilometers or so, and temperatures there are like 250 to 300 degrees C. So I said it's boiling, and this is also reflected in the temperature with depth curve. So on this diagram on the horizontal axis, you have temperature from zero to about 350 degrees C. And on the vertical axis, is the depth below surface going here to two kilometers. And these are generic curves that you would observe if you drilled here into the central part of the upflow. So what you can find in typical cases is something like this. It follows the boiling curve with depth. And as you probably all know, boiling temperature is a function of pressure. And as you go deeper in the Earth's crust, obviously hydrostatic pressure or fluid pressure is increasing, and so will be the boiling temperature uh, if the fluid has enough energy to boil. And so in this case, it has enough energy to boil to at least two kilometers depth. Whereas in this case, you have sort of an isothermal liquid upflow until that matches the boiling curve and boils on the last few hundred meters. And that reflects the different enthalpy in these two cases. So if you see something like this, the enthalpy of the upflowing water in this plume is maybe 1.1 megajoules per kilogram, whereas in this case, it's higher enthalpy and goes to about maybe 1600 or 1.6 megajoules or 1600 kilojoules per kilogram. So already from this picture, we can infer that how much enthalpy the fluid picks up down here determines the thermal structure of the system up here. Let's have a look on that in a different kind of diagram. And that's the, the uh, reservoir engineers and geothermal like this. So you have specific enthalpy on the horizontal axis. You have pressure in megapascals here, increasing from top to bottom, like it does in geology. It's on a log scale to be able to depict the liquid plus vapor region. So this would be the boiling curve in a temperature pressure diagram to depict it in, a, in, in reasonable proportions. And what you see on top of here is also um, isotherms 100, 200, 300, 400 degrees C on, and so on. And these conventional resources that are drilled in the upper one to two kilometers typically sit somewhere here in the diagram. As I said, they are boiling. And you can see if they have higher enthalpy, they would intersect the uh, liquid plus vapor boundary at uh, greater pressures, so at greater depth as well. Or if they have lower enthalpy, they would intersect at a lower, uh, at shallower depth. And that's what we saw in the previous curve. So that is what has been done for the last hundred or so years since the first installations were done in Lauderello in Italy. And when you look at this conceptual picture here, we are producing 250 to 300 degrees up here. But then there at the bottom, there is the magmatic intrusion and that has about 800 to 1200 degrees C. And you wonder, shouldn't there be something hotter at depth? And people have rarely drilled deeper because, as you saw in the previous diagram, the temperature gain that you have when you go deeper is relatively small. The curve steepens. So there was not much energy to be gained by drilling 2.5 or 3 instead of 2 kilometers. And that's why this idea never really came up until about 15 or so years ago. Some Icelanders had the idea, well, nevertheless, let's drill deeper. And they started the Icelandic deep drilling project, IDDP. And what they thought is actually drilling close to the magma and hitting, hopefully, fluid with 500 degrees C and pressures maybe at 300 bars. You see it here on the pressure enthalpy diagram. And you could also see oops, uh, what um, the advantage of this could be is if you produce it in a well, you would depressurize it and you wouldn't intersect the liquid vapor field. So in essence, in a simple minded uh, thinking, you would actually get superheated, very energetic, dry steam directly into your plant. You wouldn't need separators and all this thing in between. So that was quite an interesting idea.
Um, before I go into the actual part there, there's always a confusion about supercritical, superheated, superhot, and you name it, all these terms. And let me just briefly reflect on this. So here's the temperature pressure haze diagram of water. And the most important part that we just referred to was the boiling curve here, which starts somewhere at uh, near zero degrees C and very low pressures. And as you increase temperature, the boiling pressure increases until this curve terminates at the critical point at 374 degrees Celsius and approximately 220 bars. The other lines you see on here in gray are isocores, so lines of equal density. And you see here we're in the liquid range where our densities are high. And at the critical point, the density is about uh, 0.3 to 2 grams per cubic centimeter. And then this line is the critical isocore that separates densities that are higher than the critical ones. So they are considered liquid like, and the ones below it are considered vapor like or steam like. Then People refer to supercritical often when a fluid is in the upper right quadrangle here of quadrant of this uh, uh, diagram. So temperatures and pressures both higher than at critical. Other people prefer to have just temperature higher than uh, the critical temperature. And there's many other definitions of that. Now, the key point is this broad area of supercritical, it has by definition no phase boundaries. The key thing is you can go from liquid to gas by just tuning the pressure and there's no phase transition. Also, you can go from gas-like densities here, lowering the temperature to liquid-like densities here, and you cross no phase boundary. And that means there's actually no rigorous definition of supercritical. So take this as my first take home message. Supercritical is something that sits here, but if you want to define it, you have to convey the convention that you use. The same problem is for the term superheated. I mean, when the Icelanders did their deep drilling project, there was a sometimes heated debate of whether the fluid they encountered was superheated or supercritical or what. But consider this, line here, this isocore 0.1 gram per cubic centimeter, that would be equivalent to a steam that exists, coexists with liquid at 350 degrees C on the boiling curve. Now, if you move along this isocore with temperature, you will exceed the critical pressure here. And so then already you are in the range where you can go from vapor to liquid without crossing any phase boundary. So calling this a superheated steam or vapor is equally uh, arbitrary. And so what we came up or many people came up is just making using the term super hot as the most generic one in the context of uh, geothermal systems. And we can use different conventions for this. I like the upper one the most. So temperature is just higher than the critical temperature. And in terms of physical chemistry and, and molecular interactions, that also makes the most sense. But you can also say from what we had before in the IDDP diagram, if you stay on this side in the enthalpy pressure diagram, you would have this welcome effect that you wouldn't intersect the liquid vapor boundary upon production. So these are two possible examples that have been put forward. And they are unfortunately not identical. If you project the lower one onto the upper one, you see uh, you get into this yellow field, which would exclude, for example, any fluid at 450 degrees C and 300 bars, although everybody would consider this a supercritical resource. Uh, it would not be included in the lower one. So there is no particularly perfect uh, definition that suits all uh, purposes. So what we usually do is we say, we use a pragmatic one, we use super hot and super critical synonymously. For everything that's at temperatures higher than critical temperature of water and pressures that are typical for geothermal reservoirs. 
And depending on the application you have, you can put additional constraints on enthalpy, permeability, or whatever to characterize your reservoir. So remember, whenever I would be talking about super hot in this presentation, I mean something like, uh, let me go back here, like this orange field here, uh, higher temperature than the critical temperature of water at reservoir, typical reservoir pressures. So then this is my own only slide on the challenges in numerical simulation. When we look again at the water phase diagram and the enthalpy pressure projection, when you look at the isotherms here, uh, that's 300, it hits the uh, liquid vapor field uh, at a high angle, so no problem. But then 400 degrees, see here you see it bends around and it's pretty shallow slope here. And actually, if you were at the critical temperature, it would be a horizontal line passing through the critical point. Which means at a constant pressure, the derivative d enthalpy over dt is actually infinity. And that's the isobaric heat capacity. And here's a few examples of that. So temperature here from 0 to 800 degrees. Isobaric heat capacity in joules per kilogram and Kelvin. So you're all used to the low temperature value of about uh, four uh, joules per gram and Kelvin somewhere here. But then when you go to geothermal systems, this is no longer attainable. You have a strong temperature dependence. So the heat capacity increases for most pressures. And when you're at the critical pressure, actually it diverges to plus infinity, which obviously will cause some problems if you wanna do numerical simulation based on heat capacity formulation of your energy equation. Similarly, this is for the uh, isothermal compressibility here. It also has a peak to plus infinity. There's several other properties that are derivative of derivatives of density, enthalpy, and so on that have this annoying behavior. So if you want to do meaningful numerical simulations of that, these extreme variations near the critical point require adequate formulations of your governing equations, in particular of your energy equation. And there's the do's and don'ts. The do is use conserved properties like mass, enthalpy, and so on. Do not use saturation, storativity, heat capacity, and those because you will be in big trouble. Saturation here, for example, is a problem because it's not like an oil and, and oil simulations are something uh, that, that you can trace because there's no miscibility here. If you go through this field, your vapor saturation, for example, at a constant enthalpy will change as a function of temperature. So if you cool your two-phase mixture, the saturation will change just in response to temperature and not in response and on top of the transport and so on and so on. So these are just a few remarks on that. Be aware if you ever want to enter this field that you do not use the standard groundwater type approach. So now let's enter the, how we approach these uh, systems in numerical simulation. So I've here sketched the conceptual picture that I conveyed before, and that's sort of the geological or ge geologist view of how such a system operates. And then for decades, reservoir engineers have looked very differently on that. So for them, it's something like this. There is the reservoir that's hot, it has hot fluid, and somehow magically the heat is coming in from the bottom. And that's also how the numerical simulations of these reservoir models are being done. So you play around with bottomary, bottom boundary conditions until what you see in your simulation sort of matches what you have encountered in the field, and then you proceed. That's perfectly fine for the purposes of standard reservoir engineering in conventional resources. But obviously, if you want to learn about the near magma super hot resources, this is not sufficient because you just arbitrarily exclude the interesting part. So if you want to study such systems to understand how super hot resources can form near the magma, you have to yet additional functionality to your simulator. And this is sort of summarized in the slide. It 
it tells you what is actually the minimum physics that should be included in your numerical simulations to be able to study the heat transfer on pro flow processes in these systems. It's mostly based on the classical pa paper of Dan Haber and Steve Ingebrigtsen almost 25 years back in JGR. For me, still a landmark paper because they actually introduced uh, the full water properties into such simulations and just with this paper showed that it makes all the difference. But compared to standard reservoir simulations, what you have to do is you have to explicitly include a hot body like here, which we then consider representative of magma and just allowed to transiently cool in response to fluid flow here and conducted heat transfer. We ignore typically some radiated heat transfer. And what you definitely need is the full water properties up to the magmatic conditions. So that's really crucial. Uh, you have to include the phase relations like boiling, et cetera, the temperature pressure dependence of the properties and so on and so on. And uh, the multi-phase flow that you employ, as I just mentioned, has to be thermodynamically constrained. So the changes in saturation in response to cooling, et cetera, need to be properly dealt with. Then what comes into play here is that permeability will be temperature dependent. If you heat a rock in these, at these depths, it will actually become at some stage ductile. So it will deform plastically or viscously and it will close pores and fractures. So the permeability actually decays, it becomes smaller and smaller. And the typical function introduced by these two guys is something like this. On the horizontal action, action, uh, axis temperature, on the vertical log permeability, and then up to a certain temperature, which you could call sort of approximately the brittle ductile transition temperature, the permeability is considered to be more or less constant. And then it will start to drop in a log linear fashion until at very high temperatures, it's basically impermeable. And where this decay starts in terms of temperature is a function of what rock type you have. So in quartz rich rocks like granite or sandstone, it will start early on already at 360 degrees. Whereas when you go to quartz poor rocks like basalt in Iceland or so, it will actually be shifted to say 500 or even more degrees Celsius. That's an important point. Could also depend on the crustal deformation rate here. If you are in a setting where the crust is being stretched in both directions, you recreate permeability by creating fractures. And this could also shift this onset temperature uh, to higher temperatures uh, for a given type of rock. What you also want to do is make your domain large enough that the boundary conditions are developing naturally, like here with a magma instead of some arbitrary thing in between here. And once you do this, basically the only remaining factor to be, standard, uh, to be studied is the system scale permeability in the system in terms of geology. You may introduce different layers or so, but you've captured most of the relevant physics. So we have done this. This is from the PhD thesis of Sam Scott. And this is now using our own code, CSMP. So basically a 2D section through the Earth's crust here, finite element, uh, control volume, finite element uh, mesh here with a hot body mimicking a magma chamber somewhere here at a few kilometers depth. And then we look at what is the transient evolution of the convection system here. So we have first an initial or incipient stage. So this is after 1500 years. Um, the magma has started to trigger the convection here. And so the fluid that's coming down picks up heat from the magma and starts to rise. And on its way up here, it has to heat the overlying rock. So it doesn't shoot to the surface within a day or so. And you see here this initial plume developing. In terms of temperature depth structure, this is about this. You have the magma chamber down here. It's cooling from the top and bottom. So here in the center, you still have the 900 degrees, but at the sides, it's already cooling. And then you have the hot plume rising. And on top of that, 
the um, rock has not yet been heated. Then we advance into a main stage where the plume is fully established. You have, in this case, boiling all the way down to the intrusion, maximum extent of boiling. And that's reflected here with the boiling curve with depth down to the intrusion. And finally, actually, you're cooling your heat source, you're exhausting it. And so what you have now is in the waning stage, you have heated the rock above in the previous stages. And now your heat source is gone, but the fluid is still circulating this way. And what that means is now you start cooling the stuff from below. And you see this here with this inverse temperature in the bottom, inverse temperature gradient in the bottom. And the upper part is still boiling because the rock is still hot enough. This upflowing water is mining heat that was previously added to the rock down here. So that's the evolution of these systems. If it is undisturbed, of course, you can get a new magma intrusion, then you would restart it or elongate its lifetime and so on and so on. What is poorly understood in this, because it has not yet been simulated, is the role of fractures and faults. We know they are important in uh, natural systems, and we often don't know what is the shape and size of this magmatic intrusion. So it can be thin vertical intrusions that repeat every, uh, every few years, it can be more or less stacked horizontal features, which as a geologist we would call sills, or it can be this more volumetric magma chambers, but typically we don't know. But taking one of these as uh, an example is typically justified. So then I said permeability is the key, um, I said enthalpy is the key factor in governing the thermal structure. And with these simulations, we actually found out this depends on the permeability of your host rock. I illustrate this at the example of three post rock permeabilities, these are the permeabilities at low temperatures before you come to the um, brittle ductile transition. So if you have 10 millidarcy, and again, this diagram is temperature versus depth, taking at the main upflow zone here. And these lines are the thermal structures at different times. We look only at the main stage now, then we see with 10 millidarcy, we have an isothermal upflow at about 240 to 250 degrees C, and then boiling only in the uppermost uh, 500 meters. If you remember what I said in the beginning, this points to relatively low enthalpy. Let's now go to the other extreme. We go to 0.1 millidarcy. It's not a huge change for groundwater geologists. For us, it makes all the difference. This is now 0.1 millidarcy. And what you see here is thermal evolution, 1,000, 2,000, and so on years until 20,000. is basically a diffusive profile developing until almost steady state. And so this tells us actually the heat transfer is by conduction only. And uh, the convection of fluid is so small due to the low permeability that it has little influence on the cooling and uh, heat dissipation in the system. And now we go to a value in between one millidarcy, and that's sort of the magic number. There you get actually the most energetic systems. I mean, it's plus minus half an order of magnitude around this number, but this has been shown in all the simulations at different complexity, et cetera. And then you get actually boiling to depth to the intrusion down there. So what's the reason for this very sensitive behavior? Well, it's simply the competition of the lengths and time scales involved in convection versus conduction. So here in the hot heat source, you have only conduction operating. And as you know, this is efficient only over small uh, length scales or long time scales. And so the amount of heat that can be picked up by this fluid circulating here is limited by, um, is, is essentially limited. If you have a high permeability, you have a high flux here. And so the amount of heat that you can pick up per kilogram of water is rather limited, giving it a moderate to low enthalpy. Whereas in the low and uh, low permeability case, it's circulating so slow, it picks up all the heat, but on the way up, it's so slow, it loses all the energy to the surroundings again and it's in thermal equilibrium with the evolving geothermal gradient. And so this one here in the middle is in between. 
fluid is slow enough to pick up a lot of heat, but fast enough not to lose it on the way up. And then you get this most energetic systems where everything is boiling. So if you put this on the pressure enthalpy diagram, it's essentially low permeability. You start very hot at the bottom, but on the way up, you lose your energy. If you start with high enthalpy, yes, you do not lose the enthalpy on the way up. You go straight up in this diagram, but you haven't picked up a lot in the bottom. And this one is somewhere in between. And again, the intersection with this line tells you where the boiling is. So this was one of the first other learnings we had about uh, 15 years ago when doing numerical simulations. And I think this is quite a good reference point of how to understand these systems. So now we move into going deeper to the very hot zones. And that was inspired by the first IDDP well in Krapla in Iceland. So this is the well, uh, was intended to drill five kilometers down here. Geophysicists had told uh, that there will be no problems. And this was drilled in 2009. So initial plan, five kilometer depth. And then they drilled into magma at two kilometer depth. And they didn't recognize it in the beginning. They drilled, the well got stuck at two kilometers. They couldn't do anything about it. Cut the uh, string, deviated the well in the next attempt. Same thing again. And only in the third and the cuttings that came up with a drill fluid, they realized they had a lot of glass in there. And that was then interpreted to be quenched magma that the uh, cold uh, drilling fluid actually quenched to glass. Now, after that was understood, uh, the well was shut for a while and then some circulation tests were done and they were extremely impressive. So here at the wellhead, and luckily they had put a lot of rock debris on top of it. They reached 450 degrees Celsius and 140 bars. And the circulation tests indicated that you could get potentially 35 megawatts electricity out of the single well compared to do Typical well use today, this is really a lot, and that sparked a lot of interest to continue. Unfortunately, there were technical difficulties. A lot of the installations were not rated for these conditions. There was staining, corrosion, and in the end, this had to be abandoned. So we did then some simulations again from Sam Scott, PhD, same sort of setup, but now the focus really on supercritical resources. Defined pragmatically here as temperature higher than the critical one, enthalpy higher than that of water at the critical point, and permeability higher than this 0.1 millidarcy, just in order for the fluid to be able to flow. And these six panels down here show you the dependence on post rock permeability, one millidarcy, 10 millidarcy, and in the horizontal row, uh, Decay of permeability starting at 360, 450, 550 degrees. And what we see is basically in, in orange, we uh, actually depict what we call a super hot resource according to these definitions. We see in the high permeability cases, these remain small, but obviously the flow rates would be higher. Low permeability or intermediate permeability case, they are more expensive expensive and so you could actually find them easier by drilling into them at the expense of having lower flow rates. But that shows that just a simple factor, this uh, permeability, temperature dependence of the permeability essentially controls how uh, big such a resource is. But it also seems to show that they seem to be an integral part of all of these systems. So brittle to ductile transition temperature controls the temperature of the hottest exploitable fluid. This could be an exploration criterion. You won't have rocks that allow the fluid to access high temperatures. And it controls also the size of the supercritical resource. Higher permeability, smaller resource, lower permeability, larger resource. Yeah, I just said supercritical resources seem to be a common element of high entropy systems. So we had a few learnings from that. Uh, the conditions that were encountered here just came out naturally of the simulation. The star is what was encountered. If in our simulations, we put the intrusion at two kilometers depth, 
assume a brittle ductile transition temperature of 550 degrees C as it is appropriate for the basaltic host rock. And this is the thermal profile along this upflow zone. It goes right through the IDDP thing into the overlying high enthalpy geothermal systems and has this. So apparently we kept caught the, we captured the first order physics. Then the second one is the previous paradigm was in geothermal systems, you have sort of an ice enthalpic upflow. And then when this was encountered in Krabla, there arose a problem. I mean, how could you add, so this is again, depth and temperature. How can you have a three megawatt per kilogram resource underlying a one megawatt resource if this is one system and isenthalpic? So there were things introduced like tighter formations in between, et cetera, et cetera. But our simulations actually show there is no magic involved whatsoever. So what Sam did here, he introduced a virtual tracer in the simulation. Uh, whenever it came into the hottest zone, he had supercritical conditions. The tracer um, concentration was 100%. Was followed through the system. And you see actually by convecting in cooler groundwater from the sides, it dilutes the tracer. So the reduction in enthalpy can just be understood as having the super high enthalpy fluid coming up and then being mixed with low enthalpy fluid from the side. So the system scale flow is definitely not isenthalpic. There's no need for complex hydrology. And again, this has implications for exploring for these systems. But it also tells us the thermal structure of these uh, systems can be used as what we in ore geology call vectors to ore. And so that's one of the concepts we currently follow for the next IDDP well uh, to see where is the best location of the, uh, for drilling the next well. Another thing that came out of one of these, uh, these uh, projects, and I just mention it because I see the time is running, um, the chemistry of fluids in the reservoir can be very extreme. So in Krabla, the one we looked at, there can be so-called acid wells. They have super acid fluids and you would corrode your casing within hours or days and you can abandon the well immediately. And what we find out in, found out in our simulations is actually that it depends where exactly you are in your system, whether the cold groundwater that came in here condensed into here and then flowed up uh, is on a condensed condensation path or would actually go through here. That changes all the chemical behavior of the corrosive things inside. And you can sort of predict where it goes. Unfortunately, um, we do not have a good thermodynamic model for supercritical fluids. So this cannot yet be routinely included in reservoir models. All right, so I will just mention to you there was a second well drilled about four years ago. Uh, that was IDB2. It was drilled into the Reykjanes system. That's where this volcano uh, started to erupt uh, a few months ago in Iceland. Drilled to 4.6 kilometer, didn't hit magma. And um, just after drilling uh, at the bottom of the well, 427 degrees C was measured, but the well was still heating up from being cooled with the drilling fluid. And there's indications of much higher temperature up to 550 degrees C at the well bottom. Unfortunately, just after five days after they drilled there, the casing collapsed. And so we have no measurements from down there. And there's a lot of discussion at the moment if and how this well can be reused. So I will skip the next few slides, just indicating this one here. This is a saline system because the flowing water is actually seawater there. And here's the temperature pressure diagram of pure water, the boiling curve. If you add a third dimension, the salt concentration, then this field here is actually the area of liquid plus vapor coexistence. And you can imagine that the higher you get in temperature, the more you're prone to enter this. And then you can have all sorts of complicated paths through this phase diagram in these systems. So in particular, one thing is you start here cool and your fluid goes down and then hits somewhere this two-phase thing. And it will be very different if it hits it on this side of the red curve, because then it's a liquid that starts to boil 
Whereas if you go onto that side, you're on the dew part of the, uh, the two-phase curve. And so you have at that temperatures um, a saline, low density vapor-like thing, and you would start to condense out liquid. So I skip over these few slides that we had on this. Um, we have enthalpy diagrams on set. So I summarize with a few outlooks here what's next. We are in the process of getting to 3D models, including magma chambers. We have now well models for simulating how to directly produce, uh, how to best utilize them, direct production, Intr inject cold water to recharge your overlying resource from below, or do you want to have doublets? Fracture flow should come into place. And ultimately, we need supercritical chemistry. And this slide highlights an important point. You cannot do reactive transport under supercritical conditions at this moment. The only model that's available, the so-called HKF model for the thermodynamics of these fluids, is um, applicable only in the wide range here. And we want to go here. So we're in the process of developing thermodynamic equations of state that are valid here for all kinds of solutes. But that's things for the next few years. So in summary, the numerical simulations unravel the modus operandi of high enthalpy geothermal systems. You need adequate representation of geology, physics, and material properties. Super resort resources seem to be an integral part of such systems, so an exciting new type of resource. And the occurrence is mainly controlled by rock properties. Exploitable support resources and saline systems that I, what I couldn't discuss again anymore was you have to have a deep magmatic intrusion and advanced well models are now available. So all this is an application for pre in preparation for IDDP3. And the next big steps in terms of development will be including explicit representation of fracture zones and finally supercritical chemistry. So thanks a lot for your attention. This is a picture of a discharge test from last week. Uh, Reykjavik Energy in preparation of IDDP3 has an experimental well they call IDDP 2.5, which goes into supercritical conditions. And this is just from, I think, four days ago where they tried to do this first discharge test. So thanks again for your attention. And I hope you got an impression of super hot geothermal resources. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, we do not have much time for uh, the uh, before the next session, but we'll take a few minutes to answer questions. There is one in the Q and A, uh, which uh, I read uh, by Lotana Wazurike. Can compositional simulation be used for these supercritical fluids? Well, in essence, it is. <laughs> so. This is what. <laughs> yes. So, yes. so that's what we use for the system, like the water NACL, that we have it, yes. Uh, but otherwise, um, if we do not have the equations of state, if I understood compositional uh, simulation okay. well, then we cannot do it, of course. Yes. I have a question myself, uh, which is, uh, you show that uh, permeability variation is a key issue there. Yeah. And uh, so I am wondering, uh, there are actually two, two questions here. One, one is you take uh, variation of permeability with temperature, and the question is how do you get those uh, numbers? Mm -hmm. And the second question is, uh, of course, op normally it should depend also on the uh, uh, mechanical uh, behavior and, and mechanical equations. But uh, of course, maybe you are assuming that, uh, for instance, there is no disturbance by the uh, hot spot uh, of regional uh, mechanical uh, uh, situations. I, I don't know what, but where, what are the assumptions behind, behind that? So, so yeah, we, exactly. So what you first said is basically, where do we get these curves from? And here, this was an assumption based on limited experimental data. And uh, you can do these measurements in the lab. And a few, very few ones have been done on sort of more or less ISO uh, static pressures. And for some gabbros, et cetera, it matched these curves very well. But you're totally right. As soon as you come to non-uniform stresses, et cetera, it changes. And this is an open field of research at the moment. What we know is for different rock types where this onset of permeability decay needs to be. 
And you can see it goes down pretty rapidly. And this is basically known, but whether it makes a curve that goes like this or goes like this, I think has no big impact on the outcome of the simulation because this first little decay here makes all the difference. So then in terms of the mechanics, um, I'm happy we can do what we can do so far. So we assume a rigid porous medium. And we have started, as I showed on the last slide, a few uh, fracture flow simulations that are um, on, uh, that are, were at uh, single phase fluid conditions, uh, going this way. And there already we found quite a few things that we, um, that were puzzling to us. And uh, we had then introduced thermoelasticity, heterogeneous aperture distribution and so on on these. And we learned a lot and that's the next big step in one of the program projects that we have now that we include, that we try to translate all this to the high temperature domain, but I do not expect a simple thing there in anywhere near the next two years or so, probably much later, because there's so many factors to be learned at these extreme conditions that uh, I do not want to promise this uh, for the next year or so. We are aware of it, but it's super complicated to do this in a realistic way. Okay, I think we have to move on to the... Uh regular sessions now. So I encourage people to continue the discussion by filling up the Q&A uh, web page. Uh, uh, so we have another opportunity to uh, improve the understanding of this. Thank you, Thomas.